Born again. They say that in the court from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 that his name was Emmanuel with us and that he was born again, born. Meaning that all these things that the Christian do, having alcohol, then having all vices, adultery, etc. These are done by the other Christian. We are pure Christians. We have been born again. We previously used to have drugs, we used to have alcohol, etc. Now we have been born again. We have been guided by the Holy Spirit. It's a new sect. They believe in the Bible, but they try and interpret that all the other Christians are not true Christians. We are the true Christians and we are the only group which is going to go to paradise. That's what they say. It's a new cult that has evolved. And, they are, and there are changes in various churches. For example, the Protestant church. The Protestant church says that a person can marry. Therefore, I made it very clear in my talk, Catholic Church. My talk is very clear. The Catholic Church say that you should not marry to come closer to God. But the Protestants, they protested against the Church and said, we don't believe in so many laws of yours. One of them was marrying. Therefore, the movement is called Protestants. And again, we have born again, we have Seventh-day Adventists, we have Pentecostal, we have Jehovah's Witnesses. There are more than a thousand different denominations. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sir, most welcome. Excuse me. One question for the sisters, one for the brother. One question, sir. One for the brother. Inshallah. Can I get your question, please? Raise your voice. Doctor, that I can understand. Yes, sister, most welcome, sister. And one more thing, question. Please understand that the microphones that you're using, you won't hear it over the PA system, but the question is being recorded on the tape. So please use the microphone. Wait, wait for you to ask the question. Thank you. Um, permissible for any kind of age, like taking a child's picture, your child's picture, or you know, personal or commercially, any Can kind of the photography, sister? photography about Photog photography. What about photography? Uh, if it's permissible for, like, if I take my child's picture, or you know, for you know, keep, to keep or something like that. This is as a question: Is photography permissible? Can I take my child's picture, etc.? So there is no text in the Holy Quran speaking about photography, etc. Yes, there are several hadith speaking about photography. What you should realize, the tasweer, the word tasweer comes from the word tasawwur, meaning to think. Anything which takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, away from Islam is haram. I mean, there are references of several hadith regarding photography. If you take a photograph of a person like a singer Michael Jackson or a famous film star and you put in a drawing room, make it a blow up, it's leading towards shirk, it's leading towards idol worship, it is haram. Or any photography leading to things which are haram, like obscene photography, pornography, all these things are haram. But photography for remembrance of your parents, of your children, if you have in the in the album, Alhamdulillah. But again, if you start loving your child so much and make up a blow up photograph of a child and put it in the drawing room, big size, that is too leading to shirk. But if you have photograph of your son, of your parents, in the album to remember, Alhamdulillah. Now we are having photography of mine. Like, they are, they are shooting me. But naturally, this lecture will be heard by people who are not present here. It will take them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's for a good cause, it's perfectly fine. What the scholars say, that three-dimensional things is haram. Any three-dimensional thing, like you make an idol, that leads to shirk. So three-dimensional photography, like making sculptures, etc., this is totally haram. This thing, if it's for a good cause, taking off towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's perfectly fine. But even if this two-dimensional photography takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like shirk, etc., even that is haram. Hope that answers the question, sister. Does anyone have any question? Those who have not asked the question, ask first, please. Yes, brother. The end of the phrase, saying uh, Ibrahim or Musa. What's the question of Ibrahim? Well, that's the question that towards the end of Surah Allah, it does say Sohofa Ibrahim of Musa. What is the Sohofa Ibrahim? 
هذا من شمن عند كويشن ار سيشن ذات وي نو فور ريفليشن ماي نيم توراه زبور انجيل اند فرقان توراه از ذا ريفليشن وحي جيفن تو موزس بي بي ابون هيم زبور از ذا وحي ذا ريفليشن جيفن تو ديفيد بي بي ابون هيم انجيل از ذا وحي ذا ريفليشن جيفن تو جيسس بي بي ابون هيم اند فرقان ذا هولي قران از ذا لاست اند فاينل ريفليشن جيفن تو ذا لاست اند فاينل ميسنجر بروفيت محمد بي بي ابون هيم صحف ابراهيم از اجين ا ريفليشن بس ذا نيم از نوت ذا صحف ميز بارت اتس ا سمول ريفليشن it is not a name of a revelation it's a revelation given to ibrahim alayhi salam name is not there therefore i said by name we know for revelation torah zabur injil and furqan there were several other revelation which we don't know by name one among them is sahufa ibrahim that means even ibrahim alayhi salam ibrahim peace be upon him got a revelation the name we don't know like how the name of messengers we know 25 by name in the holy quran But the hadith, the authentic hadith says there are 124,000 messengers, prophets set on the face of the earth. So Sahuf Ibrahim is again, it's a Sahuf, it's a part of the revelation. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. I think my sister does say. Yes, sister, most welcome. The concept of the masjid. What is the purpose of it, and how is it to be used for the furtherance of the development of the Ummah? And also the Juma Kutba. I was told that during the time of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, it used to be a time when the people were apprised of their situation and given instructions as to how go about how to go about their worldly affairs. And I also understand that at some time that practice stopped. Can you just enlighten us a bit as to when that practice stopped? Why did it stop? And is it a good thing that we revive that, you know, to get direction for our daily lives? Sister asked me a question about Islamic history. And I do agree with that time of beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The masjid was the center. It should be a center, not only for a place of worship. As the beloved Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, Volume One, Hadith Number 429, that the whole world is a place for me and my followers to do sujda. Anywhere you do sujda is called a masjid. Where you do sujud is called a masjid. So masjid should be besides for offering salah, but naturally should be a center where people learn. And that was the time when, at the time of a prophet, there were people came not only to pray in the mosque, they came to ask the prophet questions. And there's a full section in Sahih Bukhari in which it says that the woman came to the prophet and said that why don't you give us time where we can ask you questions since you're cover, you're always surrounded by men. So in the mosque they used to discuss about politics. They used to discuss about Islam. There used to be question and succession, but I'm Unfortunately, now it's dying out. The sister asked the question, "Can I tell exactly when it died out?" Sister, I'm not a scholar in Islamic history. My field is Dawa, Islam and Compassion Religion. You ask me anything about the Quran, about the Bible, about the Gita, about the Veda, that's my field. If I say that I've heard somebody saying that so and so thing happened, it will be from hearsay. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 59, "Ask the person who knows." So ask a historian who's expert in the field of Islamic history. He will do a better job. I'm not a fit person. I'm fit for dawa. Ask me questions which non-Muslim poses you. I'll be the right person, sister. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Waalaikum salam. Just like in Bangladesh and Pakistan. The brother has a question: That is a woman allowed to lead a nation like in Bangladesh and Pakistan? This is a very controversial question which people keep keep on posing. There is no text in the Holy Quran saying that a woman cannot be the head of state. There is no text in the Holy Quran saying directly. But there are certain hadith which speak about that. There are two group of scholars. One group of scholars say that women cannot be the head of state. The other group of scholars say women can be head of state. I will give you the views. That there is a group of scholars says that since there's a hadith, which is an authentic hadith, which says that that nation which is led by a woman will not prosper. So that group which says that women cannot be head of state, they say that see, this was only referring to that particular time, which Persia was ruled by a queen. Not, I mean, sorry, this hadith refers. I mean, those scholars who say that women can be head of state, they say that this hadith refers to only that particular time where Persia was ruled by the queen. 
इट्स नॉट इन इटर्निटी दो से नो वुमेन कैनॉट बी हेड ऑफ स्टेट दिस दिस हदीत इट्स इन इटर्निटी डिफरेंट द ओपिनियन वॉट आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क इज दैट लेट्स रीजन आउट वेदर इट्स लॉजिकल फॉर अ वुमेन टू बी हेड ऑफ स्टेट और नॉट सी वेन यूर हेड ऑफ स्टेट इट्स प्रेफरेबल मेनी टाइम हेड ऑफ स्टेट शुड लीड द सलाह But natural, if a woman is asked to lead salah, there are certain postures you have to do. Kya am ruku sujud? And if a woman is standing in front of a man, a man will concern more on her than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, but natural, women can't even lead prayers in a mixed congregation. When congregation is only of women, she can lead. So, when you become the head of state, there are ta- you have to solve the problem of common human beings, common uh, subjects, and there is interaction. You have to meet the other head of states. Since today, most of the other head of states are men. And if you want to talk about something private in closed room, Islam does not allow that a man and woman can be in a closed room alone. The third person is the devil. So, but naturally, you can't interact with other head of states. You see, whether it be Pakistan, whether it be Benazir Bhutto or Bangladesh or Turkey, whatever it is, you see they exposed in the media. They exposed in the media. There's photography, etc. You see, there's intermingling of sexes. How much they try just to come in power? You see the previous life of these presidents. What was it? Was it Islamic? All sorts of nonsense they used to do. But when they come, they wear the scarf and present themselves as true Muslims. If you analyze that there was a survey done in Canada by two scientists, they said that the nature of the female is more of verbal. And vocal that is required for motherhood. The nature of a man is spatial. Spatial means thinking about the future, making decisions. So this, the nature of man is more fit to be the head of state than of that of a female. Now this research was done by two female scientists, non-Muslim, in Canada. If you analyze that a woman, she may become pregnant. So who will look after the government for those few months? In Islam, a woman has been given a very high status because she is a mother. Now, it's difficult for a woman to do the role of a mother and head of state. It's much more easier for a man to do the role of a father and head of state. The, and no way it is that you should be head of state. It's not a father. So, if you ask me that a woman has to compromise her motherhood for becoming becoming head of state, it's a very bad bargain. It's very bad. Because the respect and the sabab she gets, the blessing she gets for becoming a mother is far more superior than becoming head of state. Therefore, on my view, I feel it is not advisable. For my view, I support those scholars who say that women should not be head of state. But that does not mean a woman can't take part in politics. A woman has the right to vote. The Quran says in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number sixty, verse number ten, that O Prophet, verse number ten and twelve, that O Prophet, when the woman come to E for the oath of fealty, that means the woman give us a bait. to be our prophet not only electing him as a leader the head of state also as a spiritual leader the voting system of islam is far superior than the modern system of voting they can take part in vote and they can take part in politics for example the tt of hudaybiyah which a prophet agreed with most of the sahaba said a iman went at the lowest how could the prophet agree with such an unbiased tt All the negative points were for the Muslims. The iman went at the lowest. It was the wife of the beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, Umm Salma, may Allah be pleased with her, who supported the Prophet and guided the Prophet. Supported the Prophet, said what he did was right. So a woman can support, give decisions, and even if you know the incidents of a hadith in which when Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, when they were deciding among the sahabas that they should put an upper limit, they should. Put an upper limit for mahar. It was a common lady who objected from the back seat and said, "When the Holy Quran, it's mentioned through Nisa chapter four, verse twenty-one, that when you can give a heap of gold, who is Omar? May Allah be pleased with him to put an upper limit." And Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, "Omar is wrong and the lady is right. That means the woman took an objection to the breach of constitution. Quran is the constitution." So women can take part in politics in such a way, but head of state, I feel it's more preferable that a man is. Hope that answers the question. Any questions? Uh, yes, I, have a question. uh, I would uh, request that those who have not asked questions should ask first. As the rule is here, the same applies. For. If there's no question, then those who have not asked questions from the gents will ask first, so that we give equal opportunity to everyone.
that those who have not asked question get a first opportunity, then those who have asked one question will get a chance, then those who have asked two. In that way. Yes, brother. Make a dua for non-Muslim. If it is allowed or not, what kind of dua is almost or not? And also about salam. Well, the brother asked the question that can we make dua for non-Muslim and can we make salam for non-Muslim? I know that there are many scholars who say that you can't say salam. When they say salam, you should say alaikum. You cannot say full. <coughs> they fail to realize it again. Difference of opinion, go to the Quran. Don't quote Zakir said this and this Sheikh said that. Go to the Quran. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 86, it says, وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَحْيَتِمْ فَحَيُّ بِأَحَسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَانَ عَلَى قُلِّ شَيْنْ أَسِيبًا When a courteous greeting is offered to you, wish it back with a greeting still more courteous or at least the same. Allah is careful in keeping of accounts. That means when anyone wishes you, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, you have to wish back more courteously. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you should say, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you should say, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wish back more courteously. Or someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you say, Wa alaikum assalam. The words are same, but coming out from the depth of the heart. Even that's a courteous greeting. That's what the Quran says. So if a non-Muslim wishes you, Assalamu alaikum, you have to say minimum wa alaikum assalam according to the Holy Quran. I know there are hadiths in Sahih Muslim. I know that. Hadith of volume number 3, which says wish alaikum. But out of context, the context is when the Jews used to wish the Muslims assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum means may death be on you. So then wish back alaikum to you the same. So you, you take out a hadith, see Quran, no hadith can go against the Quran. Number one, Quran is first, then come the Sahih Hadith. No Sahih Hadith will go against the Quran. There has to be certain context which you are missing. So the quote, Sahih Muslim says, you cannot give. And you cannot neglect any verse of the Holy Quran. Therefore when Sheikhs differ in opinion, go to the Quran and a different opinion will be solved. Huh, unless the Quran does not mention and Hadith does not mention, then Alhamdulillah, then there can be differences. Then it's a fatwa. That when the Quran does not say, Hadith doesn't say, then according to your logic and your understanding, you start giving it can differ, then no problem. But when the Quran is clear on it, when the Hadith is clear on it, then there should be no difference, I feel. Now coming to your question, can we pray? Again, some Muslims say, you can't pray, because Quran says that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim peace be upon him, was not asked to pray to his father. Again, they're misquoting, quoting out of context. What was they referring to after Ibrahim alayhi salam? father died, then you can't pray for him. Because Quran is clear cut in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 64 and verse number 116, sorry, verse number 48 and verse number 116, that anyone who does shirk, Allah will never forgive his sin. If you die as a mushrik, you will go to Jahannam, there's no option for you. Any other sin, if Allah wishes, he may forgive you. So as a mushrik, if a person dies, you can't pray for him for sure. If a person dies as a mushrik, you can't pray. But if he's alive, can you pray for him? Yes. The Quran says in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse number 47, that when Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was taken out from his house, when he was kicked out from his house, he said, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you. I will pray to my Lord to forgive you. Besides saying Assalamu alaikum to his father who was a mushrik, he says, I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Again, which is the best form of salah, of dua? You get the answer in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 47. When Aaron and Moses, peace be upon them, when they were asked to deliver the message to Pharaoh and his people, he wished them by saying, may peace be on you, those who receive guidance. Peace be on those who receive guidance. And that was the greeting which our beloved prophet used many a time when he wrote letters to the non-Muslim kings, he said, peace be on you, those who receive guidance. Again, if you read in, in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, and Surah Qasas, chapter number 28, verse 66, Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 55 says that if the ignorant approach you, say Kalu Salama, say Salam to them. Quran says you can say salam to them. Surah Qasas chapter 28 verse 66 says, When you hear vain talk against Islam, tell them I am of not those who believe in those vain talk. Salam on you. Peace be on you. 
So you can wish, you can wish salam to non-Muslim. You can do dua to them as long as they are alive. The best dua is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa taala to give them hidayah. After they die, you can you can do dua for them. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Most welcome. Um, a non-Muslim approached me and asked me, um, why do Muslims ignore Isaac and only talk of Ishmael? And he also asked me, um, so he told me that Muslims, that uh, uh, excuse me, Allah preferred Ishmael, excuse me, Allah preferred Isaac over Ishmael because Ishmael was the one chosen for sacrifice. So how can I explain to this non-Muslim that... The, the roles of Isaac and Ishmael. I should have posed the question that why do Muslims don't speak about Isaac, peace be upon him, and only speak about Ishmael salam? And why do they say that Ishmael salam was more superior to Isaac, peace be upon him? How will you answer them? Sister, we do believe even in Isaac, peace be upon him. We believe in both. Both were the sons of Abraham, peace be upon him. We believe in both. Bible says also that both were sons. Though they misquote the Bible also. Regarding a question that Muslims say that Ishmael is preferred. The Holy Quran clearly mentions in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 253, that you are not allowed to differentiate between the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to respect them equally. We can't say one prophet is superior to the other. But Allah has given gifts to some, some He has not given gifts, stories of some He mentioned, the others He doesn't mention. So we as Muslims, we consider that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, they all were prophets of God Almighty, they were all masoom, they were all sinless and we have to respect all of them equally. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes one person superior to the other, that's his job. We as human beings, we can't differentiate between the prophets, we have to respect them equally. So if any Muslim is saying that Isaac, peace be upon him, is inferior to Ismail, peace be upon him, he is not following the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Wait, wait, wait. Please, please ask questions. Those who have not asked questions, give them a point. Be fair. It's very important to make these things easy like that. So just, uh, you know... Can I speak a bit louder, brother? I say it's sometimes important not to make them other Muslim. you got to be proud of what you are and to know what, uh, the history of the things. They are all equal, but there is a fact of is the history, which is the, the, the coming of Isaac, Iraq, is after the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the acceptance of uh, Sarah or you know to to, to uh, Hajara to be a f wife of uh, the Prophet uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Ismail for the fact is the first came before. Isaac. What is the question brother? Everyone knows no, that even I said I'm that. Bible says that, Quran says that. No, I say, says that. I the say question we, is not who's first. I said it, it clearly I said that in the Bible. We don't have to make it easy like that. You just it is very easy. Quran says you cannot differentiate. Now, what's the problem? The problem, first question was, who came earlier? I said Ishmael came earlier. Who is superior? Both are equal. Both the questions answered. No, I, I have to complicate things. Okay, but Dr. Dr. Zaka, he just want to confirm that we should be proud to confirm that Ishmael was the first. And I said nothing that. To be proud, uh, that's nothing to be hiding now. We're supposed to be proud of that. I said he that. Say, even okay. according to the Bible, Ishmael came that's first. Fine. That's even fine. Even according to the Quran. That's fine. But that does not make him superior. You don't have to hide, you know. It's okay. That way, Isaac alayhi salam came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Does that mean he's superior to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa No. So when you use the argument, use your hikmah, otherwise they will trap you. Otherwise they say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Does that mean he's superior? No. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sister, most welcome. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as um, What is... Um, okay, uh, about the... What? Come on, ask me. Okay. In Islam, what is it like about the abortion and birth control and um, artificial uh, examination? Insemination. whatever. Insemination. Should I ask the question, what about birth control? 
and artificial insemination. When it comes to artificial insemination, you should realize there are two types of artificial insemination. One is homogeneous and one is heterogeneous. Homogeneous means the sperm and the ovum is taken from husband and wife. That's totally allowed. For example, if husband and wife cannot give birth to a child due to some medical problem, and if you're taking sperm from the husband and the ovum from the, from the wife, and if there's artificial insemination, take the semen from the husband's side and implant it into the woman, the wife, it's totally allowed. But artificial heterogeneous insemination, taking sperm from the sperm bank, is totally haram. It's as good as adultery. So as long as whatever method you use, if the sperm and the ovum is of the husband and wife, it's allowed. If it's not of husband and wife, it's not allowed. That's the second part of the question. The first part of the question, birth control. People normally misunderstand the meaning of birth control and family planning. Birth control means a law taken out by a government that irrespective whether the citizen of that country or the state of law, whether he's rich or poor, he should follow the law of the government. For example, ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. After one you should not have a child, after second you should not have at all. That's the policy they have in India. You know, if it's a fixed policy by the government, irrespective whether rich or poor, maximum two children, after that you can't give any more children, you can't give birth to any more children. That's called birth control, it's totally haram in Islam. What, you, what your main question, I believe, sister, is family planning. Can we plan a family? And your, if you analyze, all the ulamas unanimously agree that permanent methods of family planning like vasectomy and tubectomy, it's haram in Islam. When it comes to abortion, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 151, and Surah Nahal, chapter, <laughs> Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 31, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. For killing of children is a major crime. So, but natural abortion is also haram in Islam. Now, you should realize that if abortion is done to save the life of the mother then it is allowed even permanent method if it is done to save the life of the mother for example the doctor says that if you give birth to one more child your life is in danger or she's suffering from heart problem and the labor pains may cause her, her heart so she has a heart problem she may die then it is allowed and the extreme case is to save the life of the mother Abortion is allowed, artificial, I mean, uh, uh, any permanent method, even that's allowed. But if there's no danger to a life, permanent methods, all ulama agree, agree unanimously, it is not allowed, even abortion is not allowed. The main controversy that arises is amongst the temporary method. I mean, there's a hadith in which one of the person asked the Prophet that I practice coitus interruptus. That means the sexual act is broken. I practice that. The Prophet was silent. So those who say that temporary method is not allowed say that, see, the Prophet was silent. That means he didn't agree with it. Those people who say temporary method is allowed, they say, see, the Prophet was silent. That means he gave permission. Now here again, in temporary method, there is a, lit, a little bit of difference of opinion between the different schools of thoughts. Here you should realize that the most common temporary method is copper tea that is used. People think copper tea is a contraception. Even when I was in a medical college, I was taught, I was taught that copper tea is a contraception. Actually, copper tea is not a contraception. What does the copper tea does? That the conception has already taken place. The ovum and the sperm has mixed to form the zygote. It prevents the implantation of the zygote on the womb of the mother. So it is not contraception, it is contra-implantation. That means a very, 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 very early abortion. So Quran says killing of children is a crime, so but natural even copper tea is not allowed. But my basic question is that why do you want to do family planning? That's my basic question. So people say that see because you know uh, there's, there's so much of population and there's so much of poverty. There's so much of poverty that you know that if you have more children you can't look after them. So Islam has a system of how to remove poverty. If poverty is a problem, remove poverty. Why or not? Why are you preventing people from coming in the world? Islam has a system of zakah. That every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 
85 grams of gold. He should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. So if you are poor, you have a right to accept zakat. Many Muslims think that accepting zakat is inferior. You become inferior if you accept zakat. It's your right, it's your haq. And when a rich person is giving zakat, he's not doing an obligation on you. He's not doing a favor on you. It's his duty to give zakat. So zakat, and if every rich person in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Not be a single human being. Some people say, no, see, we are rich people, but uh, if we have many children every year, then we can't give equal attention to them. You know, we can't give proper attention. So Quran, when it speaks about killing of children, it speaks in two ways. One is Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 151, and Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 31. The first time it says that kill not the children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. Which poor people say that we don't have enough money. If we have one more child, we won't be able to look after them and ourselves. So Allah says we'll give sustenance to you and your children. The next verse of Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 31 refers to rich people. Those who say that we will not die of hunger, but we can't give proper education to them. So Allah says, kill not your children for want of sustenance, for it is Allah that will give sustenance to your children and to you. First place says to you and your children. The second place says to, to your children and you. On the face of the... On the face of it, it looks similar, but there is a world of a difference. First verse is referring to very poor people. The second verse is referring to rich people. That Allah will look after your children and you. If my parents were in family planning, I would not have been born. I would have been born. I wouldn't have been here. I'm the fifth child of my parents. Do you think I'm a bane for society or boon for society? So the thing is that if you think. So what's your problem? Why are you family planning? Solve the problem. Kill the cause. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Al, Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 54, it says, Makaru makar Allahu, wallahu khairul makreen. That they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. So if you feel that Allah is the best of planner, you want to leave it to Allah, leave it to Allah to plan your family. If you, if you feel you can plan it better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ahalan wa sahalan, the choice is yours. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, is there any such good deeds that could be done which the reward will be greater than any other good deed that you could do? And also... Um, Sorry, so can, I, can you do any good deed in which? Is there any such good deed that could be done which the reward? Don't mean give donation. Can, can you do any good deed? Yeah. Can you do any good deed which the reward will be greater than any other good deed you can ever do? That's one. Okay. What is what is the best work you can ever do that you can get the greatest reward from Allah for that matter exactly? I'm not the best thing. This is the third part. And what I would like to say, I have more questions, but you know, only if you will allow me or wait for another Please time. one question. Thank you, Shada. So, which deed that you can do, which is the best, you get maximum sawab. The maximum. See, the Quran mentions about the sin, which is the worst. And there are various good deeds Quran speaks about. The sin which you avoid is shirk. So if you are doing shirk and you stop doing shirk, that's the biggest good deed you are doing. Shirk is the biggest sin which Allah will never forgive. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 64, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 116, that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not forgive your associating partners with him. Any other sin, if he wishes, he will forgive. But associating partners, he will never forgive. So shirk is the biggest crime. In good deeds, there are various good deeds. Tawheed aspect is there. Respecting your parents is there. Being good to your children, being good to your wife. The various good deeds. I mean, I don't know myself which is the highest. I don't know. But, but natural, the sin which is the worst is shirk. So you avoid from shirk, that is the best deed I can say. And believing in Tawheed. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Okay. Okay. Can I hold it?
Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum uh, salam. Brother Zakir, I want to ask you, uh, reading in a hadith that you should not hoard anything. You shouldn't hoard wealth, gold, anything. In fact, uh, that you shouldn't plan more than three days because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans your life, right? But our parents give us a lot of gold in our wedding and yeah, a woman tends to keep buying gold, right? So what happens is it is bought for ornamental use under the facade of investment. It's bought for ornamental use, but you keep uh, uh, pacifying yourself saying, that it is investment and then you have so much gold in the bank in the safe deposit wall just sitting there and I'm wondering and then there's a hadith where they say that if you hoard gold it will be put into your ears melted and put in your ears on the day, day of judgment or one of these things now I'm wondering whether that is permissible or should we just keep how much we're using on a daily basis a nominal amount and just remove everything in the form of sadaqa or zakah still has a question that there are people who hoard gold etc and the hadith which say that if you hoard gold it will melt and put into your etc I do agree with the hadith but normally as I said I prefer if there's a verse in the Quran talking about that I quote the Quran because I believe in Sahih Hadith not that I don't I have to believe in Sahih Hadith but if there's a verse in the Quran because any different school of thought they will say okay this hadith is Sahih this is Sahih I agree with what the hadith who quoted is Sahih I agree with that. But there's a verse in the Holy Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 34, which says that those who bury the gold and silver, those who bury the gold and silver, announce to them that on the day of judgment, the heat will be taken out from the hellfire and this gold will be melted from it and it will be embarked on the back, on the flanks and on the sides and said have ye the taste of gold you hold it so Quran says if you hold good those people who hold, give, hold gold and don't spend in the way of Allah in charity tell to them that from the hellfire heat will be taken out and from this gold you will be embarked, embossed on your back, on your sides and on your flank and said taste the gold which you hold it so holding is haram regarding the question that in the form of marriage etc they give you ornaments can we keep them you should realize that ornaments is not wrong if a lady wears ornaments alhamdulillah but it should not be extravagant limited fine you should have i've got no objection if a lady feels like wearing ornaments i don't want to deprive it of her but people who in the guise of ornaments invest and i do know of that that they have several kilos and kgs and kgs of ornaments so is it a good investment? Is it right? What I say that if anyone wants to invest in any business, the answer is given in the Holy Quran. If any Muslim wants to invest in any business, refer to the Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261. That's the master key for investment. It says that if anyone sows one grain in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing a hundred grain. That means 700 times profit. Allah promises you that if you spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you 700 times profit. In business terminology, it is 70,000 percent profit. I want to know in which investment, in which business can you get 70,000 percent profit? Which business? But the criteria for investing in this business is taqwa. You should have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have faith. We say we believe in the Quran. Wallah. Most of the Muslims don't. It's a shame on us. If we say we believe, if I tell you today that I have a certain secret business in which you will get 100 times profit, I'm sure of it. Everyone out here will give every penny of the saving in that business. If you know 100 times profit, Allah says 700 times, 70,000 percent profit. And Allah does not stop there. He said He will give you many fold. So I'm telling that it is, you have the minimum required for you. What is required? People think, and there is a hadith that you can't give everything in charity so that your family comes on the street. You can't. You can't give everything that you become a pauper. You should lead a little bit for your family also. But what is required? So I request that if you ask me for advice, are they doing the right thing? Little bit ornaments may require emergency, little bit, fine. But whatever access they have, if they want to invest it, invest it in the way of Allah. 
and whenever you want, you make dua, the wealth comes. And even if you don't get here, inshallah, in the year after you'll get. Because if you're a good businessman, a businessman does not mind having a loss in the initial stage. This life that you're leading, sister, is how much? Average 60 years. Some live for 20 years, some live for 90 years. Average, take it 60 years. If you have to undergo turmoil, etc., in this world, in exchange for paradise, it's a very good bargain. That Allah says He gives you wealth as a test for the year after. He's giving you wealth, testing you. So if you spend the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you may undergo hardship here, but in the year after you'll get Jannah. So, and those who hold gold, they will be branded with that gold on the day of judgment. The choice is theirs. Do they want Jannah or do they want to be branded with the gold which they hold? Hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah. alaikum. We have two questions, one from the brothers and then one from the sister and then Jazakumullah Khair because it's time for Asia. Go ahead, please. Uh, a couple of my friends work in places where they either have to sell alcohol or serve alcohol. What does the Quran and the Sunnah say about that? As well as, can you elaborate on that question? The brother posed the question that there are some of his friends, maybe Muslim friends, who work in a place where they serve alcohol. What does the Quran and the Sunnah say? The Quran says in Surah Maida, which I mentioned earlier, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu, O you who believe, in the most certainly intoxicants and gambling were anzabu al asnamu dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishum min amal shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. So the alcohol is the Satan's handiwork. And the next verse says that the Satan tries to misguide the people by using alcohol and brings enmity between the people. So the alcohol is a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it. Some people say that buying alcohol, I mean drinking alcohol is haram. Selling alcohol is allowed. When I was going to Atlanta and Houston, I was shocked that Muslims sell alcohol, sell pork, sell lottery tickets. Saying, where does the Quran say it is haram? I say, Quran says, Rishum min amali shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. Abstain from anything to do with it. So you know, we Muslims are very intelligent. We use the Quran to suit our living. Muslims selling alcohol. Leave aside working, they sell alcohol. They sell pork and they sell lottery ticket. Saying we don't buy it. Means if it's bad for us, other person going to hell, let him go to hell. If you are his way of going to hell, even you will go to hell. Regarding the hadith, what does the Quran say about alcohol regarding hadith? So the hadith in which our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, that Allah's curse is on those people, and He gives ten categories of those people who distill alcohol, those who purchase alcohol, those who purchase it for somebody else, those who serve alcohol, those who sell alcohol, those who make a profit of, from alcohol. All these people, Allah's curse is on them. So, but natural, those people who are working in areas which are selling alcohol, if they themselves are serving alcohol, it's totally haram. But there are situations, for example, if you're working maybe in a company in which boss has alcohol or they serve alcohol to the guest, but you are not the person serving, then you don't fall in that category. And you should realize the business being done by that company, if it is serving alcohol as a major expense, for example, if you say, that can I work for an airline? I'm just trying to give an answer in a much broad way. Can I work for an airline? Because most of the airlines serve alcohol. You see, the kid said that you can't work in a company serving alcohol. See, in the airline business, if you're a hostess who serves alcohol, then it's haram. But if you're a ground hostess who does not serve alcohol, since alcohol is not the major profit of the airline, it's a minute percentage. The major profit is buying tickets and selling tickets. Alcohol is a minute percentage. Then the Sharia law says that if the major income of that company is halal and a minute negligible portion is haram, think that the salary of your income is from the halal income. So if you're a ground hostess, though the airline serves alcohol, you yourself should not serve it. But you are employed by that company which serves alcohol. The income of that alcohol is minute percentage. So Islamic Sharia says you can work for that airline. But naturally you can't work for a bar. 
in which they sell alcohol because they are serving alcohol and the major income of that bar is from selling alcohol, it's haram. They have to change the job as soon as possible. Hope that answers the question. Inshallah, I think as the chairperson said, the last question will be from the lady side, from the sister's side, and then we'll have the Salah of Isha. Isha Salah. Yes, sister, most welcome. We depose uh, to you, Dr. Naik. And that is, uh, can you speak whether or not uh, Muslims uh, should in the American political process in this instance or in any other processes that are not headed by Muslims. Sister, again I asked a question on politics that can a Muslim take part in American politics? Sister, I'm an Indian. I don't know what's happening in American politics. I'm not allowed. You have to ask an American Muslim politician. Secondly, I'm not a politician. Muslims should take part in politics, yes, as a general rule. America, I don't know. As a general rule, the Quran says that women, as I said earlier, took part in voting. So Muslims should take part in voting. Should they take part in American politics? I'm not aware of the American politics. I don't even know the parties. Only I know who the president is. That's all. I'm not aware. We have to ask a Muslim politician. Politics is part of Islam. There is a field of politics in Islam. But then you have to ask a politician. He'll be an expert in that field. I'm not. And neither do I know the situation of America, so I cannot comment. Hope that's the question. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is, this closed the meeting. And we thank very much Dr. Zakir for his enlightening lecture and for his intelligent and good answer for many questions. And if we keep receiving questions as such and answers as such, we will keep staying in until morning. So we have to give him a break because he spent a long time traveling from one place to another. And when he came, he came very early. And he spent all this time, about four hours talking. So he needs rest. Inshallah, let us pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless him, may reward him for his own effort, and may make him very successful in his own lecture everywhere. I think you still have some other meetings. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you.